Hi everyone, welcome back to Cambridge University Astronomy. It's been a while since we've done one of these talks, but now it's the summer holidays again and we're going to be doing a series of astronomy sessions for younger audiences all the way through the holidays. And I'm really happy to be kicking off with this topic here today, uh, which as you've seen the title of the video, I'm sure you will know, it is the new space race. So I'm going to be talking today about this new exciting race for space that is going on between lots of different companies and lots of different countries to explore all kinds of different things in space and take some of the first steps out into our solar system. So what I'm going to be doing today is giving you just, I'm going to talk about the space race full stop, what was the space race, what's going on with the space race now, who's taking part and what are some of the things that we're going to be doing now and off in the future. Um, for those of you uh, that have been to one of these talks before, you will know the drill. For anyone that doesn't, these are interactive sessions and you can join the talk using a service called Slido. Um, and so all you have to do is take your mobile phone and go to slido.com and enter the code hashtag space race. Or to make life easy and even easier, you can scan that little handy QR code thing that you can see there in the top left of the screen. And that's you can be on, we're going to be able to do two things with that. Um, first of all, I'm going to be able to answer, ask you guys some questions as we go along, and you can participate uh, in some some polls. And then secondly, as you can see, some people are doing right now, like Luca and Amara. You can ask me some questions. And so at the end of the talk, we're going to have a whole question and answer session where you can ask me all the questions about space that you like. Um, but for now, yes, we, let's kick off and talk about the new space race. So I think I'm going to talk. I'm going to start by asking you guys a question. So I've been talking a lot about this the space race. It's worth asking one very very simple thing, which is what actually counts as space? How high up do you think space is? If you started off from the ground here, how high would you have to go to reach space? And so I'm going to uh, open that up on Slido. So um, like I said, if you want to join in, you can just go to slido.com and use hashtag space race or scan the little QR code thing there and you should be able to join in. So I will uh, just give this a few moments uh, for you to uh, get these answers in. I will say there are some really nice questions uh, coming in already, uh, which I really like to see. All right, I'll tell you what, I'm going to hide the answers um, as they come in uh, so, you, so, you can't, uh, so you can't see other people's things. Uh, yeah, so thank you to uh, thank you to Luca Rage Eight who's submitting lots of very nice questions. I can see a few from Amara, uh, one from Os Oswin. Um, so yeah, if you have a question uh, either at the end of the talk or as we go along, uh, feel free to shoot it my way, and uh, well, I will do my best to answer as many as I can right at the end. Okay, so just a few moments more, and then we'll have a look at what some of you are saying. Let's have a look. Uh, biggest answer, 100 kilometers, 100 kilometers um, out of our atmosphere, 60 miles, 100 kilometers. These, uh, I'm very, very impressed, first of all. These are some very, very knowledgeable answers. There are absolutely no silly answers here um, whatsoever. The, the biggest answer, the most popular one, is about 100 kilometers, uh, which I think is pretty spot on. So if I, I have a, just to explain uh, how we define the edge of space, I, th I think almost everyone uh, got this got this pretty much right. Um, the edge of space is where the atmosphere ends, right? So there's the Earth and there's the atmosphere and then space is out of the atmosphere. But the problem is there's no obvious line to the atmosphere. It sort of just goes up and up and up and gets thinner and thinner and thinner. And then eventually there's no atmosphere around you and you realize you're in space. But until then, um, it's quite hard to see, uh, to say where the boundary is. There's no obvious edge. So we can look at some pretty high things on Earth and then see if we can get a guesstimate for where the edge is. So we can start off with mountains, like Mount Everest is about eight kilometers um, high. So if you stand on the top of Mount Everest, you're about eight kilometers above the surface of the Earth. Um, slightly above Mount Everest, you get aeroplanes. Most aeroplanes fly around 10 kilometers high. Um, not actually that much higher than Mount Everest. If you're in a plane, this is the reason that planes don't fly over the Himalayas and fly over Everest, because they're not actually that much higher than the tops. 
if you go much higher than planes, we get to the part of the atmosphere where meteors happen. So those of you at home that have seen shooting stars, what you're looking at when you see a shooting star is a piece of rock from space burning up around 70 kilometers up in the atmosphere. And I think that gives you a pretty good guess that around that height is where the atmosphere sort of starts or ends because meteors can happily travel for millions of miles through space and then when they hit Earth they burn up around 70 kilometers. So you can see where that, that's where the atmosphere starts becoming important. And then far above meteors you have the International Space Station which is about 400 kilometers straight up. <clears throat> So even from this, you can tell that what we call space is going to be in between these with space above and not space below. And so a lot of you actually got the answer spot on. So what we call space is 100 kilometers above the surface, and that's called the Kármán line. So um, that's what we define. It's Again, it's not like a hard and fast border, um, but if you've been above 100 kilometers, you can say that you have been to space. And if you've not been above 100 kilometers, then it doesn't quite cut it, I'm afraid. Okay, so let's get on to this space race. I think before we talk about the new space race, it's worth talking about what the original space race was. You know, why are we calling it the new space race, not just the space race? Well, the original space race happened uh, more than 50 years ago, and it was this big competition, if you like, between t these two countries, the Soviet Union and America, who were the most powerful countries in the world at the time. And they each were competing to almost show off how powerful and how good their country was. And the way they did that was by trying to make better and better technology to put things and to put people in space. And the idea was, if they had the, the best technology, they could say, okay, well, look, we're the, you know, we're the most successful country. I think if you were to ask most people on the street, especially in this country, they would say America won the space race because they put people on the moon for the first time. But the Soviet Union did a lot of very successful things as well. So the first ever artificial satellite, it was called Sputnik, and that orbited the Earth in 1957. So, and that was done by the Soviet Union. They put the first ever satellite in orbit around the Earth. They also landed on the moon for the first time, not with people, but with an artificial robot called Luna 9, which landed in 1966. And it took this photo you can see from the surface of the moon. So the first ever moon landing without people was done by the Soviet Union. Um, they also uh, put a, a space station up there. They got the first landing on Mars called Mars 3 in 1971. They did, did a lot of amazing things. But of course, America did the most famous thing, which is putting people on the moon for the first time. That was the launch of Apollo 11 in 1969. And then Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walked on the surface of the moon while Michael Collins stayed behind and orbited around the moon. Um, this is hugely important. It's one of the most important things the human race has ever done. But what's interesting is that when the space race finished, we stopped going to the moon. Uh, we went to the moon for the first time in 1969, but then in December 1972, the last astronaut left the moon forever. So since the 14th of December 1972, there have been no astronauts on the moon. That's nearly 50 years. Um, I think it's really interesting. Think about how fast technology has come along in 50 years. Think about how amazing computers are now compared to how they were 50 years ago. Think about how amazing phones are now compared to how they were 50 years ago. Everything has advanced so much, but we've sort of given up on going to space for the last 50 years. I remember everyone got very excited a few years ago when Elon Musk's SpaceX company launched uh, this a car into space. But there's been a car in space before which drove around on the surface of the moon in the 1970s. There was a car with a person driving it on the surface of the moon. Um, I think it just really goes to show you how well we were doing with the space race and how much we've, how much th our priorities changed and we kind of gave up. I think if you went back to our, and asked a person in the 1960s what would life be like in the year 2000, they all dreamt of having cities on the moon and people taking tourist trips to Mars and all these kinds of things. Uh, but the space race stopped and we uh, we stopped doing these things until now. So this is why we talk about the new space race. So in the last few years, people have got more and more and more interested in going to space. And things are really starting up again in really, really exciting ways. The most exciting thing about the new space race is that there are a lot more people in the competition. There are more people taking part in the race. 
originally, remember I said it was just the, the original first space race was between these two companies, uh, sorry, countries, America and the Soviet Union. The new space race is a lot more open. There are 72 different countries around the world now that have their own space programs. And along with uh, NASA and the European Space Agency, there are countries like India, Brazil, Japan, Canada, South Korea, the United Arab Emirates. There are lots and lots and lots of different space programs all over the world, which makes me really excited because going to space shouldn't just be for one country or two countries. It's something that we are all doing as human beings. We all live on this earth together, right? So the fact that we are all taking part in this race for, race for space more and more, I think is really, really good news. The most interesting thing for a lot of people is that as well as countries going to space, there are also companies like businesses all about going to space. So SpaceX, for example, led by Elon Musk, um, is launching people into space and has plans to put people on Mars quite soon. Uh, Blue Origin is another one uh, that's uh, that's owned by Jeff Bezos, the guy that started up Amazon. So Blue Origin is also launching things into space and Virgin Galactic as well is uh, planning on sending tourists into space uh, very soon. So the space race is a lot more open. There's a lot more players and a lot more people interested in getting to space than there ever used to be, which makes me really, really excited for the future. I can't wait to see what happens with this new space race. So what are the goals of the new space race? What are we trying to do? The original space race uh, was all about uh, putting technology in space and getting people to the moon. But the new space race is a lot more open. There are lots of different things in space that people are interested in doing. Um, we'll start with the moon because NASA has this new program. They've uh, Well, it's, it's not new now. It's been running for many years. But NASA has a program called the Artemis program, which is all about humanity's return to the moon. And I think this is a good stepping stone for talking about the new space race, because NASA is wanting to use Ar the Artemis program and the, and the moon as the stepping stone to the rest of the solar system. You can see their logo here they've got at the bottom. That's the moon with Mars just lurking behind it. And the idea is if we send astronauts to the moon quite a lot, that'll, be, that'll teach us and give us the technology that we can go further and further in the future. So the Artemis program and going to the moon is the first step to exploring the rest of the solar system. The Artemis program is well underway and it's actually going to be starting soon, sooner than you might think. So the first launch of the Artemis program is going to be called Artemis 1, kind of obviously, and that's going to be launching in November 2021, so this year in just a few months' time. So there won't be people on this on this uh, on this mission. What's going to happen? They're going to build the rocket ready for people, so with seats and life support systems and everything, but just not put astronauts in it, and then send that to orbit around the moon just to check that it, everything is working okay. And then Artemis 2 in a few years will have people on it, but it won't land on the moon. It will just go to the moon and orbit around and then come back. And then eventually Artemis 3 will land on the moon with people. So Artemis 1 launching in just a few months. Um, things are already preparing for the launch. This is the actual Artemis 1 rocket that's going to launch uh, that mission uh, to the moon. And it left the factory last year. And is uh, that this is a picture of it on its way to the launch site. So things are really in play. And so November this year, we'll be able to watch this mission, this like kind of practice run for taking people back to the moon, which is very exciting. Um, this is Artemis 3. This is going to be the mission that sends people back to the moon. And that's happening in a few years time, like maybe 2023, probably a bit beyond that because plans often change. But this is going to be a very important time. This is going to be the first time for more than 50 years that people have been back to the moon. It's also going to be really important from, from a diversity in astronomy and, and diversity in space travel point of view. Um, so far, the only people that have ever walked on the moon have been white men that have gone up with NASA. Um, the Artemis program will be taking the first female astronaut, the first astronaut of colour to the moon, which again, I think is so exciting that space travel is becoming more and more something that is available to everyone and not just a select few group of people. So the Artemis program, this return to the moon is going to be happening and starting very, very soon. Part of the Artemis program as well, which I find really exciting, is the plan for this lunar gateway mission. And this is going to be a satellite, a space station, which is going to be in permanent orbit around the moon. 
the idea is that it's going to be a stopping off point for astronauts on their lunar missions. I think the original plan was to have the, the, the lunar space station there first, and then the astronauts would go and visit it. But again, plans change, and it turns out now that the first astronauts are going before it, and the lunar gateway might get there in around five years or so. Um, but even still, it's, I, I think it's going to be really, really cool to have this space station orbiting the moon, acting as a, as a dropping off point and a stopping off point for future moon missions. It's going to make going to the moon much, much easier. As for what we're going to do on the moon, there's lots of different plans which uh, include making a bit of a base and leaving it there so astronauts can visit and revisit it. But there are also long-term exciting plans like this one here. So this is something that um, is quite close to my heart as an astronomer. There is a long-term plan to put a telescope on the far side of the moon. So the idea will be to build a radio telescope in a crater on the moon and on the the dark side of the moon facing away from the earth and it will be protected from all the earth's kind of noise and radio chatter and will get one of the best ever views into the distant universe um this is very far in the future right i don't think we're going to be building a telescope on the moon in 10 years time and probably not even in 20 years time but i think it's really cool and really exciting that we have these long-term plans and uh yeah i wouldn't be surprised if we if we see this being built uh reasonably soon so there are lots and lots of really exciting plans involving the moon of course the next step after the moon is going to be mars and a lot of people have been thinking about space travel to mars even in that nasa artemis logo you remember the moon was the first step and you can see mars in the background we've been exploring mars and dreaming about mars for a very long time because in a way in the past mars was sort of earth's twin it's this dusty desert planet nowadays but if you could get in a time machine and travel back in time mars would have looked a lot more like earth it would have had uh, an atmosphere and clouds and water on the surface and so for this reason, a lot of uh, astronomers and a lot of scientists think that Mars would be a wonderful place to host life in the past. And so we've spent a lot of time sending missions to Mars to look for any signs of ancient life. This is the Mars Perseverance rover that's driving around on Mars right now that launched earlier this year, or sorry, that landed earlier this year. And uh, Mars Perseverance is just one of the missions on Mars looking for uh, signs of ancient life. It's driving around here. This is a picture from Mars, uh, from out the back of Mars Perseverance rover. It's driving around in this place called the Yezero Crater, which, again, if you could get in your time machine and go back in time, would look like this. It's an old dried up lake, which means it's a fantastic place, hopefully for uh, that there might be old signs of life on Mars. Um, but it's not just NASA that's doing this. Remember I said there are lots and lots of different countries which are all thinking about going to space. And there are loads of countries that have recently launched missions to Mars. So China is one of them. So along with the Perseverance rover, there is what's the, what they call a Tianwen-1, which is a Chinese lander and rover, which landed on Mars on the 14th of May this year. And so it's a, you can see the little, uh, like the, the robot rover on top of this lander here. And Tianwen is doing something really similar to Perseverance. Um, it's driving around and looking for signs of ancient life on Mars. There are not just landers, there are things orbiting Mars. Um, this is a really, really exciting mission. This was launched by the United Arab Emirates. It's the first, um, first mission to Mars from the Arab world. And it's called the HOPE mission. And what this satellite does is orbit around Mars and tries to learn more about the weather on Mars, which is going to be really important for supporting our robot missions. And also it's going to be really important for when we think about humans on Mars in the future, because if you have people on Mars, being able to tell what the weather's going to do is super important. So we need to learn about the Mars weather before people go to Mars. People going to Mars is probably quite a long way off um, still at the moment. Um, if people talk about maybe people going to Mars in the 2030s. I, I suspect it will be a bit later than that, maybe around the 2040s or so. But there are a lot of people working very, very hard and thinking very, very hard about how to get people to Mars. So NASA in America and SpaceX, this, this private company owned by Elon Musk, has the, one of the main goals of putting people on to Mars. Um, of course, there are loads of problems you have to solve, uh, even basic things like how to grow food on Mars, how to get water out on, out of the uh, the rocks on Mars. So it's going to be a very, very difficult thing. It could well be one of the most complicated things that humans have ever done to put people on Mars. But there are lots of people trying really hard to do it. And I, again, I can't wait to see what happens. 
it's interesting to think if the first people go to Mars in the 2040s, that maybe means that the first person to ever set foot on Mars um, might be in primary school right now. So someone that's in year five, year six or something like right now, you could well be the first person on Mars. You never know. Um, so I think there's some very, very exciting times ahead. But even Mars is not going to be the end. Mars is just a stepping stone to the rest of the solar system. Something that a lot of people are very excited about are asteroids out there in our solar system. And a big part of the new space race is dedicated to finding asteroids and getting the kind of the, the resources from asteroids in our solar system. Because there are a huge number of asteroids in our solar system, uh, about 750,000 that we know about. And definitely there's just millions and millions of more waiting to be discovered. This is a, a, a simulation of some of them. Uh, you can see uh, the, the, that's the sun in the middle, then the, the orbit. So it goes Mercury, then Venus, then this blue one is Earth, this red one is Mars, and this really far out orange one uh, is Jupiter. Then all of these little firefly dots of light you can see uh, swarming around the sun are different asteroids. And each one of these asteroids um, will be full of precious materials that uh, might be very, very valuable to us. And just to take one at random, this one you can see here, I've highlighted this one here in red. This is an asteroid called 1998 KU2, which I know is a super boring name. Astronomers are pretty terrible at naming things. But this is an asteroid that people think is probably worth around $80 trillion in terms of like the precious materials that are inside this asteroid. It takes many, many years to orbit the sun, but you can see its orbit comes quite close to Earth. So you never know in the future, it might be possible to go and retrieve this asteroid. Um, $80 trillion for reference is about all the money in the world for one year, right? It's about the entire, all the money that is made in the world for one year is worth the same as this one asteroid. So the first person to go and get this asteroid and uh, kind of claim it and get all the stuff out of it will probably become the richest person that has ever lived. So you can see why there's a huge amount of excitement in mining asteroids, because there's an enormous amount of stuff out there waiting in our solar system for us. Um, of course, there are kind of pros and cons of getting resources and getting things out of asteroids. The pros is just comes down to how much amazing stuff there are in these asteroids just waiting for us. There are asteroids that have tons, you know, millions of tons of things like gold and platinum. And even things like rare elements, so things like they have funny, you might not have heard of these, called palladium and tungsten. These are elements that are important for making electronics, like in your mobile phone, in your computer, and in things like solar panels and electric cars. We need these rare things to build them. These are quite hard to come by on Earth, but there are asteroids that are full of them. So if we can get these resources out of the asteroids, we might be able to just make, you know, it might be the end of these, the problem of resources here on Earth. And also, pro probably most importantly, and the reason why I'll talk about in a minute, water, or technically ice, right, because it's out in space, it's really, really cold. Asteroids are very, very rich in water, and it turns out that having a good source of water in space might be the most important thing of all for the new space race. Um, of course, the cons are that it's really, 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 really difficult to get and reach to an asteroid and bring it back. And it's also going to be really, 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 really expensive. There have been at least two companies that I know of that have been founded with the goal of mining asteroids. And after spending millions and millions of dollars and even building some, some space rockets and stuff, they have eventually gone out of business and had to sell all their stuff. So people have tried to do it, but so far, no one has really got close. Um, it doesn't mean it's impossible. It just means it's really, 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 really difficult and really, 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 really expensive. Um, of course, some of the problems are, so imagine we've found our asteroid that is full of lovely resources and we want to start mining it and we start, want to start getting the stuff out. One of the questions is, how do we actually do it? You know, how do we get at the stuff? One idea might be to bring the asteroid back to Earth, to send a rocket to the asteroid, push it back to Earth and land it somehow. And then, of course, once the asteroid's landed, we can mine it easily. Another idea might be to bring the asteroid back, but rather than crashing it into Earth, just you park it in orbit around the Earth. So it just goes round and round and round Earth. And then if we want to mine it, if we want to get any of the resources out, we just fly up to Earth orbit, which is quite easy, and get stuff out. Another idea might be we don't move the asteroid at all. We just mine it in space and bring the pressured materials back. 
Bringing the asteroid back to Earth is probably quite a silly idea. It's going to make mining it easily. You know, if we crash land it in the middle of the desert, we can just mine it quite easily. But it might be dangerous. Big asteroids hitting the Earth can do a lot of damage, right? You just have to ask the dinosaurs. And secondly, I think the most important thing, we might not need these materials on the ground. A big part of the new space race for the future is going to be building things in space, like building rockets in space and building maybe human habitation in space. Seems like a bit of a waste of time to bring it all the way back to Earth and then launch it all the way back into space again. So what we might end up doing is just mining these things in space and leaving them in space to make things out of. Um, just not moving the asteroids at all, just mining it in space might be difficult because we, we would have to fly a whole mining factory out to space. So that would probably be difficult as well. So lots of people think the best option would be to bring the asteroid back to Earth orbit. So to choose a really nice juicy asteroid that's full of uh, maybe rare elements, maybe water. And then we, if we could bring it back to Earth orbit, we could use it as a stop off point for future missions. So yes, this would be our asteroid. We could just bring it back and we could just park it around the Earth and then we could just kind of fly up to it pretty easily whenever we wanted. Now, you remember before that I, out of all the things that I spoke about we might be able to get out of asteroids, I described water as being maybe the most important, which sounds a bit strange, right? When I say there's you know things like gold in asteroids and there's things that we actually make electronics from, why is water the most important? Especially because water is everywhere on Earth. Well, it turns out that water can be used to make rocket fuel, which sounds pretty weird, right? But it's, it's genuinely true. So water is H2O. You might have heard that in school. It's made of hydrogen and oxygen. And it's a pretty simple experiment to split water up into its component stuff. So if you just zap water with some electricity, you can split it up into hydrogen and oxygen. And oxygen is useful because we can breathe it. And hydrogen is useful because we can make rocket fuel from it. We already use uh, hydrogen as fuel some places here on Earth. This is a, a hydrogen fuel pump you can just see at a petrol station. So hydrogen fuel cells already exist. And it's a really, really important component of rocket engines. If we could get an asteroid in orbit around the Earth that was full of water and extract the hydrogen, we'd basically have a floating resource for fuel out there in space, which is going to make it way easier to explore the solar system. At the moment, to launch a rocket from Earth into space, you have to take all your fuel with you, and that's really, really expensive. This is the Mars Perseverance rover as it launched last year. And so the actual Perseverance rover is this tiny part at the top of this enormous rocket. If you see an enormous rocket going that like up like that, the bottom part is all the engines, but almost all the rocket is just fuel. Um, you have to all, you just have to burn all the fuel to go up, and then you the fuel also is heavy, so you have to burn more fuel to lift the fuel, and then you have to burn more fuel to take that fuel up, and more and more and more, and you end up just having to take a, a whole rocket full of fuel with the bit that you actually want to take into space is this tiny thing that sits at the top. If we could get an asteroid around Earth orbit and turn that into rocket fuel, it would be like having a floating petrol station uh, orbiting around the Earth. It would make it way cheaper. All you would have to do is get into Earth orbit, and then once you are orbiting around the Earth in space, you could just dock with the uh, dock with the asteroids, uh, get harvest some rocket fuel, and jet off to the solar system. So. This would be a very expensive thing to do, right? Finding a nice asteroid, bring it back to Earth. It would it would easily be the most complicated thing human beings have ever done. But if we do it, it could well be our gateway to the rest of space. Um, there's one important thing as well, which uh, a, a question I will leave you with because I don't really have an answer to this. There's like a moral ethical question, or which is, should we even mine these asteroids? Human beings have done quite a lot of damage to the Earth by mining the Earth and extracting all the Earth resources. There are a lot of astronomers that think maybe we should be a bit careful about doing this to the rest of the solar system. Maybe the most important thing is that we mine some of the solar system, but we leave a lot of the solar system alone to be natural solar system space wilderness. Um, again, we, we don't know. These are the questions that people talk about. But yeah, maybe it's not very ethical to just go and just mine all this, uh, all these solar systems because what happens when we use those resources up? So yeah, I think there's a big debate about whether we should even be doing this in the first place, which I think is very interesting. Um, okay, so that, that's asteroid mining. I think the final reason I'm going to talk about is space tourism. 
And so this is something that's been more and more in the news recently, because of course the first people that ever went to space um, were professional astronauts, right? So for a long time, if you wanted to go to space, you had your job had to be being an astronaut, and you had to work for NASA or a different space agency, and that's how you got to go to space and go to the moon. But recently, about 20 years ago, people started being space tourists. So these are three astronauts. Then this guy on the left hand side, his name is Dennis Tito, and he was the first space tourist. Um, he paid a lot of money. He paid about $20 million to go to space and go to hang out at the space station in April 2001. And since then, more and more people have done it and it's getting cheaper and cheaper. So you might have seen a few weeks ago, this is the launch of the Virgin Galactic um, spaceship, which is going to take tourists right up to the edge of space. They don't quite go to space. Uh, remember, uh, right at the beginning, we were talking about that Kármán line, which separates the atmosphere from space. It went right up to the edge of the atmosphere, right up to the edge of the Kármán line, but not quite. So they got to float around a bit, but they didn't quite count as being astronauts. But, you know, but they can go higher in the future. Um, the most interesting thing is that they are taking tourists. It's something that you can just buy a ticket for in the same way that you can buy a ticket for a plane. Um, of course, it's a lot more expensive. It costs about $250,000 per ticket at the moment. So definitely not something I could afford. Uh, but people are doing it and it could well get cheaper in the future. There are even more uh, even more things going up. So Blue Origin as well, uh, just a few weeks ago, went uh, went to space and took some non-professional astronauts and they actually crossed the Kármán line and went into space itself. Interesting, this is something you might have noticed. Both the Virgin Galactic flights and this Blue Origin trip to space, they came back to Earth very quickly. They didn't actually stay in space. When you think about astronauts going to space, you often think of astronauts blasting off and then floating, you know, orbiting the Earth, and you see them floating around in the space station. Both the Virgin Galactic trip and the Blue Origin trip really just went up and went to space and then fell back to Earth very, very quickly. I mean, with the parachutes, they were so they were safe. They didn't stay in space. Um, I, I was going to talk about it originally this week, but there's not really much time. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to do an entire talk next week about how astronauts stay in space. The trick is all about getting into orbit. Um, it's how to go to space and stay in space. It's something that at the moment uh, the, these companies haven't, haven't actually done. So yes, tune in next week and we'll talk all about how astronauts stay in space. Um, but these, com these companies like, like Virgin Galactic, like Blue Origin, like SpaceX, they're doing more than just take tourists up into space. Um, SpaceX, uh, this company I've spoken about a few times that are, that's planning to put people on Mars, their rockets are going to be taking people to the moon as part of the Artemis mission. They've designed this new rocket, which they call the Starship, which looks super cool and futuristic. Um, these are the rockets that are going to be taking people back to the moon. So more and more, this, this space race is just getting open and open and open. It's like, it, it's quite funny just looking back 50 years and just thinking that there were only two countries in the world that could take you to space. Uh, these days, there are loads of different countries that are going to space. There's loads of different companies that are going to space. And most importantly, they're working together. The space race used to be this big kind of like competition fight between two countries. And they would like hide secrets from each other and each try to beat the other. These days, it makes me very happy that the space, that this new space race is a lot more about cooperation and about people helping each other because at the end of the day we're all just humans living on living on the planet right and so getting into space is like this quest this mission that all of humanity is on and it makes me really really excited for the future um it could well be that in our lifetimes uh, it might be quite easy to take tourist trips to the moon and take tourist trips uh, beyond that um this yeah it could well be that the solar system is going to get a lot more open and a lot more accessible Okay, final question for you uh, before I go to the Q and A. Um, just out, just totally out of interest. I want to know: Would you like to go to space? Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm, I will tell you my answer. Uh, I'll tell you my answer in a minute. Okay, so far we have one yes and one maybe. I suspect we might have a bit of a bias sample, right? Because you guys are tuning in to a talk all about space travel. So you might be very, very specially space keen people. Okay, just while you're doing that, I'm going to go over to your, the, the, the Q&A. 
Oh, I can see so many good questions have come in. So yes, do keep your questions coming. I might not be able to answer them all because I can see absolutely loads, uh, but I will get to as many as I can. Interesting. Okay, so it's looking like yes, yes is the winner, but not an absolutely clear winner. So yes, followed by maybe, followed by no. Um, so I'm glad to see glad to see lots of people are are space keen. It means we have lots of future astronauts um, in our ranks uh, that might be keen to go to Mars and maybe even beyond. Okay, let's have a look. I am going to go over to the question and answer now. Uh, where are we? Okay, so uh, yes, for anyone that's joined late, if you want to join the question and answer, uh, there are two ways you can do it. Um, you can join uh, slido.com and use hashtag space race or hat scan that handy little QR code in the corner. Um, oh, I will say just just before I do the questions, um, if, if you've enjoyed this talk, uh, maybe consider subscribing to our channel below. We're going to be doing these talks every single week during the summer. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I am astronomy underscore Matt. I'm, I'm going to be advertising these talks. And so all these events um, you can see on our uh, on one of our channels. OK, let me see. Let's go and have a look at some of these audience questions. Okay, first of all, uh, Luca, aged eight, uh, asks: Is it true that Russia is making a nuclear rocket? And if they are, what does it? What could it mean for space travel? Um, this is a really excellent question. So, as far as I know, the answer is yes. So, Russia has this nuclear rocket, which they call Zeus, if I remember right. Um, it means, um, if it works, then it would mean that space travel gets a lot, lot easier. Nuclear power is obviously a very powerful form of propulsion in the same way that nuclear power stations can generate an enormous amount of energy, an enormous amount of electricity from just a small amount of fuel and a small amount of uranium, a nuclear rocket could generate a huge amount of, of thrust with only a tiny bit of rocket fuel. So if it works, it would make space travel much, much easier. The, the problem, of course, and the danger is that this stuff you use to power nuclear power is very, very dangerous. So nuclear rockets would take uranium, uranium as fuel. And uh, I th I, a lot of people are quite worried about the idea about taking a piece of uranium and then blasting it off into space because sometimes rockets fail. Um, sometimes rockets, uh, you know, don't manage to, you know, don't manage to make it all the way to space. Sometimes something goes wrong and they explode. A lot of people are quite worried about the idea of taking some uranium and then exploding it over the Earth in the atmosphere. So I think recently America banned the use of uranium for space travel. Um, so no American thing is going to be using it for, uh, for the time being. So who knows? I think it could be an interesting thing. It would definitely make space travel easier, but it is also uh, it also um, would be potentially quite dangerous. Okay, I'm going to answer. I, Luca, you have loads of really good questions. I'm going to answer some others um, just so you can uh, just so we can get them in. But I will come back to some of these top questions. We have a question from Arav. Ar Arav, I hope I'm pronouncing that okay. Um, the question is, if we can harvest asteroids, would the economy explode? Um, again, that's a really, really good point. Um, the, the, the prices of things on Earth is sort of based on how rare they are. Um, like the price of gold, for example, or the price of platinum is set by how much gold there is. If we found an asteroid with billions of tons of gold and brought it back to Earth, gold would kind of become used, like worthless, right? Because everyone would just have as much gold as they want. Um, I so yes, I think if if we could genuinely harvest an asteroid and bring it back to Earth, it could potentially do very very strange things to our economy. Um, this is maybe one of the again one of the reasons uh, to leave the asteroid in orbit around the Earth because then we wouldn't be just bringing all the the things down to Earth and just spending it. Things would stay in orbit around the Earth. We would use it as like either a fuel depot or like a launching off point for future space missions. Um, where are we? I can't find your question to tick it off. Uh, so yes, forgive me. William, age six, says, how many asteroids are in the asteroid belt? Um, the answer is millions and millions and millions. The rule is that the bigger the asteroid, the rarer they are. So in terms of really, really, really big things, like hundreds of miles across, there's really not very many at all. Uh, Ceres is a minor planet in the asteroid belt, and there's only one thing as big as Ceres. But then the smaller you get, the more of them you get, the more of them there 
there are. So there are only a tiny number of very, very big things, but there are millions and millions and millions and millions of tiny little kind of boulders and rocks and pebbles floating around the asteroid belt. Um, so yes, the, the, the answer is a very, 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 very big number indeed. Although if interestingly, if you add them all up, you don't quite make a planet. So the entire weight of the asteroid belt is only about 10% of Earth. So if you kind of, if you've got all the asteroids in the asteroid belt and smush them all together, you would only make something about 10 times smaller than the Earth. So yeah, all of them added together aren't quite enough to make a planet, but there are still millions and millions and millions of them out there. Uh, Harrison says, can rockets be powered by solar panels? Um, they and they absolutely can. Um, the I think so. There are a couple of different ways we're thinking about using solar panel to power solar power to to power rockets. Uh, one way would be solar panels. Uh, the issue with that is that they would have to be very 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 big. Uh, they probably can't get into space using solar panels. But once these things have got into space, they could definitely collect uh, collect energy uh, in the, with the solar panels and use that. Uh, another way is something called a solar sail so it doesn't really feel like it you can't really tell by holding your hand up to the sunshine but but light has a little push to it um, a bit like the wind right if you hold your hand up you can feel the wind pushing on it light also pushes on your hand as well it's not very much so you can't really feel it but in space where there's no wind if you open out a really big solar sail that was hundreds of meters wide like a big kind of reflective mirror the power of the sunlight could actually push it along and so there are lots of rocket designs people are thinking about the ways to explore the outer solar system and maybe even other solar systems one way might be to build one of these big solar sails to launch into space and then open the big solar sail and then use that to uh, like surf the solar wind off out into the universe so i think yeah i think solar power and solar sail power i think could well be very very important in the future for space travel um luca i'm going to come back to one of luca's questions how many rockets have been used in the space race in total um a very very big number i don't know the number exactly i think somewhere between 30 and forty thousand rockets have been launched full stop um so um it depends what you count as the actual space race but humanity has definitely launched tens of thousands of things um into space over the last few decades and this and that number is only going to go up um amara says how many new satellites are going to be launched um i think the answer to that is really quite a lot um, so uh, because of the space race being coming a lot more open and there are a lot more countries and companies taking part, um, I think it's very likely that, um, that there are going to be lots and lots and lots of satellites going into orbit around the Earth. Uh, one of them in particular, I think, is, might, might even put thousands of new satellites up. So SpaceX, this company that I keep talking about, um, has a program called Starlink where they are put, the idea is to put tens of thousands of satellites around the Earth and they're going to be orbiting really close to the Earth and providing internet to everyone all over the world. And uh, if these, you know, if these, there are thousands of these things uh, planned and there are lots and lots and lots there already, um, I think when this thing finishes, the, the whole Earth could be surrounded by satellites that you'd be able to see all the time. Uh, this is quite controversial like some people think this is a good thing because it would mean you could get internet anywhere in the world if you were just walking through the Sahara Desert or in the middle of the Pacific Ocean you could get internet from one of these satellites but a lot of astronomers think it's a bad idea because there'll be so many satellites in the night sky it actually might make it quite hard to see the stars um, so uh, so yes I think there are whatever happens I think there are definitely a lot more going to be launched in the future they're going to be way 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 more launched in the future than exist right now um, Saul are we in the race um, I'm not sure what you mean by we I'm not sure where you live um, I'll talk for me so I live in in the United Kingdom which is part of uh, Europe and the European Space Agency is one of the uh, one of the big uh, one of the big players in the space race. So, along with NASA, which is the American Space Agency, and the the Chinese and the Russian space agencies, the European Space Agency is a really big part of space technology. Yes, um, we uh, we've been putting rovers and uh, we've been putting things uh, into space for a very very long time. We have a part to play in the James Webb Space Telescope, which is a very fancy space telescope that's being launched later this year. So uh, yes, Europe is a very, very big part of the space race. 
Um, Aliyah asks, where does the water come from on the asteroid? Um, that's a really good question with a very interesting answer. So the answer um, is that the water is on the asteroids because sort of that's where the asteroid, where water lives in our solar system. The water on asteroids has been there since the formation of our solar system. If you could travel back in time thousands of millions of years, like before the planets even formed, like before Earth even existed, there was lots there were lots of asteroids in our solar system with water on them. And the water came from like the cloud of gas that formed our solar system from the in the first place. So the water is like really, really, really old water back from when the solar system formed. Interestingly, we now think that Earth's water actually came from being hit by asteroids and comets. So when the Earth was first born, it was just a ball of rock. It didn't have any water on it at all. Um, they, their water is so common on, as on asteroids that Earth being hit by like millions and millions and millions of asteroids as it was forming was what created our oceans. So the water on the asteroids has been there since the formation of the solar system and um, it's where we, we owe our entire oceans uh, to the water on these asteroids. Uh, Lydia H4 says, can cats go to the moon? Um, as of right now, I think the answer is no. Animals have been into space. Uh, the first animal in space was a dog called Laika that the Russians launched. Uh, so animals do go to space. I think right now cats can't go to the moon. But you never know in the future if you could go on a tourist trip to the moon, you might be able to take your cat. You might have to get a small cat-sized spacesuit for them. And I think it'd be quite fun to watch them jump around in zero gravity. Uh, so right now the answer is no, but I think it would be very cute in the future if... Uh, if the answer became yes. Um, Luca, aged eight, have most space companies in the USA, are, are they trying to get on Mars like SpaceX? Um, I don't think so. So most companies, uh, all these different companies have slightly different goals. So SpaceX's big goal is to put people on Mars. Uh, but Virgin Galactic's big goal is to do space tourism, is to... Um, is to uh, you know, make it easier for people to go into space. Um, Blue Origin spa uh, goal, uh, the, the Amazon one, is to eventually, they have a very long-term goal of putting people um, into, uh, sorry, uh, you know, building space colonies for humans. So lots of different countries have lots of different, oh, sorry, lots of different companies have lots of different goals. Um, okay, where are we? How many asteroids in the solar system, says Sophia? I think I have answered that one. The answer, I think William asked, uh, asked the same question. The answer is millions and millions and millions, fortunately, which makes me quite happy because if people are a bit worried about us using up all the asteroids in the solar system, the fact that there are millions and millions and millions of them means we would have a very long time to go. Uh, Rose, age nine, asks a very important question. Has Brexit affected the UK's relationship with ESA, the European Space Agency? Um, I'm very happy to say that the answer is no. Um, so we have, uh, yes, we have left the European Union, but the, uh, the, the European Space Agency, ESA, is totally separate from the European Union. And so yeah, the UK... Um, that our membership of the European Space Agency has not been affected by leaving uh, leaving Europe, which makes me very, very happy. I think the European Space Agency is very, very important, and so I would be very sad if that was true. Okay, um, I think that's probably a good place to end it. I've been going for about 50 minutes at this point. Um, I'm really sorry. I would love to stay and answer your questions, but there's, there's about 50 questions still to go, and I would be here for hours um, if I answered them all. Um, thank you so much. I hope you um, I hope you enjoyed this talk. Please do um, consider giving our channel a subscribe um, if you uh, if you enjoyed it, and please do tune in next week. So we're going to be talking about going to space again next week. But to, but next week we're going to be answering the question: How do astronauts go to space and stay in space? In other words, how do orbits work?